Hi, my name is Zamo Solanke. I'm a pharmacist and business strategist based in Brisbane. Now, as you all know, my lovely wife Natasha is joining me again today. Morning, everyone. And uh, we're here to continue our normalizing conversations uh, journey, I guess. Specifically talking about uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome today, otherwise known as PCOS. So, Natasha, throughout her pregnancy, uh, has had to do some a little, uh, I guess, additional testing as a result of um, being diagnosed at an early age with PCOS. But she's actually at 28 weeks now, and that's followed, I guess, a lot of the tests. Yeah, <laughs> very exciting. So, time has flown. Uh, but what that's done is that it's given us, I guess, a little bit of perspective as to what the journey looks like for someone with PCOS up to, I guess, the 28 week mark. For those of you that don't know, uh, PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome is a hormonal disorder that affects about 10% of Australian women, uh, but actually affects about 20% of indigenous women of childbearing age. But if uh, women's BMI or body mass index is above 30, unfortunately that even goes up to around 30% of Australian women with um, childbearing age actually unfortunately suffering from this condition. So what that affects, that affects a few different things at various stages of, uh, I guess, a female's life. Can it affect things with in insulin sensitivity, with like acne, uh, because it does affect uh, the male hormones as well, so the um, androgens as well, it can cause other things like uh, excessive like weight gain and facial hair and things like that as well. Um, or body hair in general. So there are some complex, I guess, symptoms as a result of PCOS as well. The other main thing is actually increases the risk of type 2 diabetes because it actually plays a major role in, uh, I guess, increasing insulin resistance. So there's a few different treatment modalities that have been used for some time, I guess, to help manage these symptoms. But what we're going to do is discuss, I guess, Natasha's journey when she was diagnosed, I guess, uh, with PCOS, what led her to that diagnosis, uh, I guess, and then how that's translated through different stages of her life, uh, and then, I guess, leading into pregnancy as well, because for a lot of people, it can actually affect the ability to fall pregnant. Uh, for some, uh, some less than others, but for some more than others as well. So, um, Natasha, let's start, I guess. When were you diagnosed with PCOS and I guess what prompted you to actually, yeah, find out about, you know, oh, do, do you have it? Yeah, so I was about uh, 17, 18, just as I was starting my first year of university. Um, coming out of like high school, I played a lot of sports, um, living at home with mom and sort of transitioned into kind of living on my own um, at uni. And uh, a lot of the sports and exercise did drop off and the eating habits were uh, slightly worse, but it got to a point where I had kept putting on weight uh, more than what I knew that I was sort of eating. And I was like, I know it's not great, but it, I couldn't correlate it. Um, and had really bad, uh, fa uh, basically body hair, a lot of facial hair um, uh, that I wasn't used to as well. And it was just a little bit kind of uh, something new. I wasn't sure, I wasn't quite aware of what was going on or I hadn't really, really didn't give it much thought. I sort of just put it down to, um, yeah, my bad management of lifestyle basically. And one year when we uh, went back, when I flew back um, to Botswana um, for the summer holidays, um, we'd been talking to some family friends and they actually recommended going to see a doctor in South Africa who'd been uh, really helpful and that they'd heard a lot of um, that might be able to help out. Uh, Mum and Dad made an appointment. Um, it was all kind of, they didn't want to raise any suspicions or, you know, cause any body issues or anything so it was more just like a bit of a checkup they never sort of went oh you know something's wrong or we think mm. there's something there it was more just let's go have a look you know I had really bad acne when I was a, uh, younger as well sort of you know coming into my teens and that had sort of flared up a little bit as well again um, so it was a dermatologist that we went to go see um, in South Africa and uh, just chatting with him you know I sort of went this is what's happening this is you know the symptoms I'm seeing not really sure just kind of feels a little bit off and he pretty much instantly went it sounds like PCOS um, you know, we'll go for it, go for an ultrasound. Um, we'll just check everything out, but that's really what it sounds like to me. So, um, I did, I went for the ultrasound, um, and there were, there were little cysts on my ovaries. Um, I was sort of fortunate it was on the milder end. 
um, than it being really severe, but it was obviously still there and it started causing some of these issues. So once he kind of confirmed that, I went, look, this is actually what it is. You know, this actually explains all the symptoms, you know, that you are getting. Um, there are some more, but if this is what you're seeing, it still kind of ticks enough of the boxes to go, this is what you need to, you know, this is what you've got. Um, and how to manage it and you know he was really helpful in um, putting me on uh, I started the pill um, like Samil said just to balance out the hormones there's obviously a bit more of the uh, testosterone and some of the male hormones coming through hence a bit of the weight gain and the facial hair um, and also uh, metformin so again really although it was quite a mild case of PCOS that I had it obviously had been affecting my sort of insulin resistance and ability to, to kind of manage that so uh, put me on uh, metformin and also sort of introduced me to the whole concept of kind of low GI eating um, and really kind of just how to manage my, my eating habits a little bit better going you, know, you might not have to cut out everything but it might just be a case of incorporating a bit more exercise into your into your lifestyle and a bit more management of you know when I eat carbs what I eat what's low GI what's not and just some tips and kind of going this could be a better way to help just get everything back into gear and sort of just manage it over the long term a little bit better. And I think, yeah, I think raising, touching on that point there is that lifestyle plays a massive role. You know, like I mentioned at the start, 30% of Australian women who have a BMI over 30 suffer from PCOS versus 10% of Australian women or even 20% of Indigenous Australians. So definitely that correlation yeah. there between, you know, lifestyle weight and things like that definitely does increase the risk of getting PCOS. So with the start of that treatment, I guess, when did you start to sort of see effects did, uh, to, I guess, help, particularly uh, like with lifestyle, not even just the medical treatment, yeah. but also changing your lifestyle? To be honest, it was quite instant. Um, once I'd started all the kind of the medications, the pill and everything, I'd probably say within a few months, like the weight kind of dropped off. Um, uh, I'd obviously kind of been at home at the time when this had happened. So mum and dad were great and sort of just helping get into the habits of the lifestyle and eating and that while I was at home just so when I went back to uni I was a little bit more prepared with you know ideas of kind of what to do what to cook and um just getting back into that habit so um, when I did go back to uni I started at a gym um I got you know for me personally I just got a PT to help out initially just to kind of get me back into the rhythm of things and like what to do to help try and manage it um and it was uh I, yeah I was quite fortunate within a few months I was sort of back to being what I was used to, if I can call it that, from yep. um, my, before this sort of had all flared up. So did you find, like, and speaking as a personal trainer myself as well, did you find that the accountability of having someone else, uh, I guess, set goals with you and ensure that you are adhering to a lifestyle that was, you know, assisting your health, did you find that beneficial? For me personally, definitely. Yep. Um, I found that, you know, whilst uh, I'd initially just joined a gym, you know, would kind of rock up and sort of be a little bit unsure and probably a little bit uncomfortable is probably a good word and kind of mm -hmm. what to do um, you know what equipment to use was I doing it right was it actually going to help and a little just a bit uncertainty which made me feel less comfortable wanting to go back and I found mm -hmm. having a PT to sort of go kind of, this is what I'm trying to achieve this is what I want and feeling a bit more accountable going okay I have to turn up but also knowing that there was someone there to guide me a little bit through mm -hmm. it um, mentally gave me a bit more sort of peace of mind and comfort to keep going back and really get stuck into it yep no fantastic I think that's very important because at the end of the day, um, whether or not it's a PT or a loved one or a friend or any sort of accountability yeah. measure helps to ensure, I guess, that you stick to the program, you stick to what you need to do and you set those goals for yourself, yeah. whether or not it's even using social media and putting it up to friends and family and tracking, um, tracking your progress with your loved ones yeah. is a great tool. We see that all over socials now, don't we? Uh, where so many people post up that they're going for a run in the morning just to hold themselves accountable to a community that you're not seeing face to face, you're seeing virtually, especially in these COVID times, uh, that actually allows you to stick to those goals yeah. and definitely persevere with that. So I think that's extremely important. So you've started your medication, you're, you're in uni now, you've noticed that there's changes in your, you know, I guess your body image and things like that. Then... I guess with obviously, you know, one start, you know, falling pregnant and things like that. But let's take a step back. When you were discussing with your doctor, obviously these questions would naturally pop into your mind. Does this affect your fertility? Does, you know, we hadn't even met then, you know, what does your outlook yeah. look like? Run us through that. Run us through that sort of outlook. So it was probably one of the big things and 
to be fair, at that age, it probably wasn't something that I necessarily thought about. Um, yeah. But it was something that obviously mum, having been with me through it, kind of went, oh, you know, on a few things, how this is going to affect um, Tasha's fertility. Um, and the, you know, the, the response I've got through that initial doctor and sort of subsequent doctors when I got back to Australia was, um, it shouldn't affect your your ability to get pregnant. Um, being on the milder side, but also the medications are on, um, shouldn't be a hindrance to go, you're not going to be able to fall pregnant naturally. Um, they probably, at that stage, I never really thought too much more about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just went, great, that's all I need to know. It's not going to affect anything. And that was it. Um, didn't really kind of think through uh, all the, more the implications, or not implications, but you know, obviously being on the pill by the time we wanted to start trying was about 10 to 12 years and just naturally your body's a little bit different um, and probably never kind of thought that through because it just wasn't something that was at the forefront of my mind um, for quite a while. So I guess having that reassurance coming uh, from a doctor about, you know, I guess, but you were quite young at the end of the day, but knowing that, you know, fertility shouldn't be an issue, obviously then you've been on the pill for 10 years, let's call it 10 years, right? 10 or more years. And most women out there, depending on when they are diagnosed with PCOS, because it does affect women of, you know, childbearing age, might be quite young, you know, I guess when they do start the pill. So they might be on the pill for 15 years, even 20 years and things like that. So I guess for not, and that would have obviously regulated your cycle and things like that. So coming off the pill, knowing that you wanted to fall pregnant, Tell us a little bit about that. What was that like? What were your expectations? And then what was, I guess, reality? Yeah. Uh, expectation was honestly, I'd stop the pill and everything at that point would just continue regulating the way it was. Sort of going, I've been on it for this long. That was the purpose of the pill. Uh, and my body would just do what it needed to do. And it would, you know, I'd just keep having my regular monthly cycles. Um, in that period when I was on the pill, I'd gone from the monthly um, cycle pill to the three monthly cycle pill as well. Um, obviously, there was benefits of that when I was taking it to not having to need a cycle every month. And again, the only question when that happened was, is this going to affect fertility? And the response I got was, no, there shouldn't really be any hindrance or it shouldn't prevent you from falling pregnant naturally. So I never kind of followed that through or thought it any more past that point. So when we decided that we wanted to start trying and have a family, um, I just expected I'd come off the pill and everything would just sort of auto regulate and my body would just keep doing what it was meant to do. Uh, reality was very different to that. Um, I probably took at least 12 months before I got any resemblance of a regular cycle. Um, in between that, it pretty much sort of auto, sort of continued with every three months. There might have been a little bit of bleeding, but it really wasn't enough to warrant like sometimes it wasn't a full period it might have just been for like a day or two um sometimes it was longer than that three months which made trying to work out you know when we were going to be trying incredibly difficult uh, i had no idea what was going on sort of when were the good times to try when we're not how that was going to affect everything and that for me was a little bit of a mental um sort of surprise because I, I had no idea what was going on and wasn't quite sure of why uh, things hadn't gone back to normal and why it was suddenly taking so long and mm. sort of went, you know, if we want to be trying, it wasn't happening as quickly as possible. You know, was there something I'd missed? Should I have stopped earlier? Um, and a few questions that probably uh, had I known a little bit earlier about how long it might take to get everything back to normal would have probably factored in a little bit differently into our journey. So I guess, yeah, mentioning what we may have done differently, like in my opinion, may have considered stopping the you know, I guess the pill earlier yeah. and using different forms yeah. of contraception and things like that uh, to, I guess, figure out where your cycles sort of land, yeah. I guess, and um, try to sort of, map, you know, I guess, map it all out, I yeah. guess, on your end. Um, so obviously, we're pregnant, you know, great, yay. <laughs> uh, and obviously, throughout that journey then, when we first fell pregnant then, what was, I guess, well, sorry, even leading up to pregnancy, it did take a little bit longer. There were a few challenges, as Natasha mentioned, to pick that time, to pick that opportune time to try. Um, and definitely using a fertility specialist was definitely a big part of assisting us in that process. So I guess from, I guess, feedback and I guess little tips and things like that is don't wait, you know, don't, don't wait. And yes, things might normalize and things like that, but have those chats early because at the end of the day, 
you don't know the stage you're going to be at or what's going to come in the future. So whenever you're ready, that is, obviously start looking at and having those conversations with a fertility specialist or even your GP yeah. that you're comfortable with because we started off with our GP, which was fantastic, you know, yeah. and at the end of the day, engaging the GP in those conversations was great. Um, if you still don't feel as comfortable going with that, even chatting with your local pharmacist as well. I know I've had these sorts of conversations with a few of my patients as well, um, obviously then referring them on to their GP eventually as well when they felt comfortable. But start somewhere, start somewhere and start early, I guess is my uh, advice. Because you just never know how long it's going to take. Um, you might have a timeline in your mindset. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we definitely had a timeline in our mindset and two years later, we're, we're on the journey now, you know? So, and this is what I guess the whole point of these videos are about is to, I guess, educate, not only educate, I should say, but share the journey and just go, well, look, you know, it's, it's not all, you know, it doesn't happen by a click yeah. of the fingers. And, and for a lot of people out there, and, and unfortunately, it's now becoming not only the minority, but it's actually slowly creeping up to be the majority. Uh, as we live busier, more stressful lives, and there's all these other external influences yeah. that I guess affect these sorts of things as well. Um, so yep, yeah, we're pregnant, great, awesome. What were the first things or the, I guess, additional testing that was needed to be done to ensure that, I guess, the bub was gonna you know, develop healthily and things like that, particularly, I guess, around you know, your differences in, you know, controlling sugar levels and things like that, yeah. so. Uh, so I guess the one was the sure, the glucose tolerance test, um, and also just the weight management, obviously being at PCOS, being a little bit more at risk of um, putting on weight more quickly, it was something that I had to just be a bit more mindful of um, during this point, because, you know, your body's changing, you're eating things, or you're not eating things, um, you know, aversions, or you're not feeling well, and just being a bit more mindful of making sure that I was continuing to eat healthy and keeping up the exercise a little bit to manage that risk. Um, with the insulin side of things, um, the glucose tolerance test, every pregnancy uh, does a test of around at the 28 week mark, um, just because you can develop uh, pregnancy diabetes essentially. Yeah, um, gestational diabetes. Gestational yes. diabetes, yeah. but um, being slightly higher risk, I had to do one at around the 12, 13 week mark, um, just to test it then as well. Um, having stopped a lot of the, the medications um, to help manage the PCOS as well during the pregnancy, it was just to ensure that... That was, sorry, that was mainly metformin, wasn't it, that you yes, were saying? Um, just the metformin basically, yeah. um, just to sort of come off that, um, was really to manage that and make sure that there wasn't any side effects or so nothing, my body was still kind of doing what it was doing during the pregnancy, nothing was flaring up. So um, the test is... Uh, can be a little bit brutal. It's at least a 12 hour fasting test, um, following which you go into um, wherever you're having the, your, your bloods taken. Um, you do sort of a base bloods test where they will take some blood just to test uh, you know, what it is after that fasting period. You have 10 minutes then to drink a glucose drink. Um, it's probably a couple hundred mils, it's not huge. Um, everyone will tell you it is terrible, so I think the idea is everyone sets your expectations super low. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, I didn't find it terrible. I, if you're feeling a bit ill or not well, I can see why it might kind of cause a little bit of um, feeling a little bit sick during it, but uh, essentially you have that, uh, you've got to drink it within 10 minutes, and then an hour after your first bloods, you have a second blood test. Um, and they'll take some blood, and then you've got to wait another hour, and they do a third one. So over the course of two hours, it's just sort of monitoring your blood, how your blood, uh, after taking, uh, before and after taking the glucose drink, how your body's actually breaking it down and making sure it's it's doing what it's meant to do. Um, and during the test as well, if you do feel ill or you know throw up or faint, um, you unfortunately have to redo the test again. They can't continue on with it. So um, depending how you're feeling and how your pregnancy's going, it may mean that you may have to do it uh, more than once, unfortunately, if you do have some of those um, negative symptoms. So I think like what would be your biggest, you, you, you use the word brutal and hopefully that doesn't, uh, I guess, dissuade anyone from going. I think hopefully that might have been a small exaggeration. Yeah. You know, for some people, obviously it might be unpleasant, but definitely, uh, I guess what, you know, obviously make sure that you do get this done. It isn't, you know, I don't think it's, the end of the world, you know, at the end of the day, there is obviously the small prick with the blood and things like that. So if you are afraid of needles and things like that, obviously even consider going with the support person. But when you mentioned that sort of that two hour block and things like that, what would be your tips 
to, I guess, uh, managing that time, making sure that you fast it correctly and things like that. Would you say one book first thing in the morning? As as yeah, yep. uh, I definitely did. I think sort of getting the earliest appointment possible just means your fasting period is as, you know, you can eat something um, earlier on in the morning. I know for me personally, well, um, after with the, the test, sorry. After the test yeah. um, with the pregnancy, I get hungry really early in the morning. So kind of after the first blood test, I did sort of have to sit there and breathe it out because I can feel myself feeling a little bit uh, uncomfortable um, and start getting a little bit lightheaded. So I know it's um, everyone's going to be different, and I think that's why it's it is uncomfortable. Um, you know, not eating for twelve hours, particularly when you're pregnant at twenty eight weeks, um, mm. is hard. Mm. It, you, know, you you get hungry a lot, um, and also uh, not as much water during that period as well. So you're not hydrating, um, you're not eating, you're going in and you know taking the bloods. It, it does make you feel a little bit. Um, it can make you feel a little bit uncomfortable um, for a little bit there, but definitely kind of, you know, for me personally, I think the earlier you do it in the morning, it'll just sort of help make sure it's kind of done and dusted and out the way first thing, um, and then you can just sort of make sure you get some food and water and hydrate as soon as you can after that. So yeah, those are great, I guess, tips, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you are well rested overnight. You are fasting, I guess, for 12 hours. You know, you've probably only had dinner the day before, uh, so book first thing in the morning, that's probably the best bet. Um, and make sure that you do have a support person, either drop you off, stay with you, yeah. or then pick you up after, or even just take snacks or something to have immediately after the testing as well, so then you can sort of replenish, um, I guess, yeah, yeah. Your, your energy stores um, following the test. So, PCOS, I guess, and that all passed, that all went well, that all, yeah? Yes, both of the tests were negative, which was great, just knowing I was a little bit more at risk and unsure of sort of what was going to come back with. So I was um, yeah, just very fortunate both of them were fine. Yeah, great. So that was awesome news for us. Now I know as a pharmacist and I see uh, ladies suffering from just gestational diabetes almost every day. It's, you know, we're definitely very, very fortunate. However, those that do uh, actually get diagnosed with gestational diabetes, we are so blessed in Australia to have a really, really great support system through the National Diabetes Services Scheme, or NDSS. Now, when your uh, obstetrician or, um, yeah, your obstetrician or your, your doctor uh, consults with you about gestational diabetes, they would fill out and register you for the National Diabetes Subsidy Scheme, uh, which is a little bit of paperwork and that gives you subsidized uh, access to crucial uh, measuring tools to monitor your sugar levels, but under our Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, also potentially subsidized medications as well. So depending on you know where you sort of sit, the doctor might do a wait and see approach uh, where you are just more rigorously monitoring your sugar levels yourself and reporting back to your doctor or might commence you on some medication as well, including potentially insulin as well. Now, insulin is a big topic in itself and we won't go through it here as well, which I'll, I can definitely, um, I'll be making a video in the future about that. But essentially, definitely have a robust discussion with your pharmacist or your doctor about getting comfortable using insulin in particular, because insulin is a foreign beast to a lot of people and it can be quite daunting, but it doesn't have to be. Through, I guess, really, really smart techniques and just making sure that you're actively managing it yourself uh, and in partnership with your other healthcare professionals will help you feel very, very confident using it. So definitely reach out to your healthcare professional team or your and your pregnancy team to, uh, I guess, get the best tips and tricks as to how to manage that appropriately. But I'll be posting a video about that pretty soon as well. So, uh, GTT or glucose tolerance test, all sweet, 28 weeks, great. We had a visit with our obstetrician uh, earlier in the week and yeah, everything is looking fantastic, which is amazing. I guess, now postpartum, so post-delivery, you know, we, we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Yeah. We don't know what her, you know, I guess, and what we've found through, you know, I guess my research and things like that, a lot of mothers actually quite, you know, their, their hormones, because of all the hormone fluctuations <laughs> in pregnancy, actually quite, actually begin to normalize based on, you know, I guess this, depending on the severity of the PCOS, which is, you know, something to definitely look forward yeah. to. 
is that postpartum, you know, that her, her PCOS might not actually yeah. be, you know, causing any issues or her hormones are all fine. Um, but for others, that might not be the case. So as we go on this journey, we'll definitely be, I guess, keeping track of that and seeing where that ends up, yeah. I guess, and, and what that sort of look like, looks like. But I think, Natasha, would you say that the biggest thing right now, and I think even our obstetrician has sort of suggested, is keeping an eye on your weight? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it is easy, uh, or I, I can see why it could be easy to uh, start eating a little bit more. I'm you know, hungry quite religiously, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner now. Um, definitely can't skip meals and a bit more conscious of needing to make sure that I, I, I do continuously eat. And, um, you know, and it's going to vary between every pregnancy, um, but you are eating for two, um, you know, especially as the baby grows there's just you know drawing down on you for everything that they need all the nutrients and stuff so you, you're constantly feeling like you need to replenish and um, just keep yourself um, going as well with the energy levels and particularly here in Brisbane um, as it's starting to get warmer uh, and the humidity is kicking up I know I've definitely felt it um, getting tired a little bit more dehydrated a little bit more um, energy levels a little bit lower so wanting to eat a bit more and particularly every now and again more sweet stuff um, just needing to feel like I need a bit of that spike so kind of trying to manage that and be conscious of that of what I'm eating and um, making sure it is balanced and how I'm getting that energy rather than just going straight for the sweets which is that quick energy kick uh, is something I am conscious of and particularly the obstetrician um, you know with the PCOS sort of gone you're getting to the point where just make sure um, we're just a bit more aware and managing it so it's not just constantly fluctuating up or down or um, you know eating the wrong stuff to, to get those spikes and it's going a little bit off track yeah, so and I think you just you you just briefly touched on it is the hydration point as well. I think that's probably the most important because at the end of the day, your uh, blood pressure in pregnancy t typically can be a little bit on the low side. So definitely making sure that you are super hydrated, uh, not over hydrated, but you know well hydrated throughout the pregnancy is is very important. Um, but just to sort of round out and give I guess like final tips. We've talked about weight management and things like that. How have you gone about actually doing that or what resources have you pulled on to actually effectively help to manage your weight? Um, one, to be honest, uh, we've started doing a veggie and fruit box um, which gets delivered every couple of weeks and for me that was a, a good way to ensure that we uh, we had vegetables that were being delivered and that we were making sure that they were a part of our diet. Yeah. Um, it was very easy sometimes just to go down to Coles if we didn't have anything at home or as I was walking around, you know, pick up a little bit more of the meats and other stuff and not quite sure what to do with veggies, whereas this was a, a way that I found um, they were there and I sort of went, I can't throw them out, so just started Googling recipes, how to use them, how to incorporate different types of vegetables, so it's not only the same things I'm going to, um, you know, the potatoes, which are a little mm -hmm. bit carb heavy as well, um, and really a mix of things to incorporate into the diet, which has been um, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that I was quite conscious of as well is trying to keep each of the meals sort of a balanced meal, so, you know, not trying to cut necessarily anything out, but, um, you know, if it was a little bit less red meat, sort of just being thinking about how else I was going to get um, you know, proteins or uh, what, how was I still going to get everything I needed if there was something that I didn't feel like eating or was you know, didn't really want to, mm. um, went off for a little bit of time. Yep, and that's a really good point because at the end of the day, most people uh, think of weight management as being exercise. Well, no, actually 70 to 80% of weight management comes from diet. However, that other 20%, Natasha, you've gone to, like, you've gotten uh, some advice from a physio as to what exercises yeah. to do, uh, swimming has been a great help as well, just to get some buoyancy as well, and you find that there's, great. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. there's a lot of, I guess, less uh, weight-bearing yeah. sort of activities, but the final thing that we're gonna leave you with, I guess, is, is being really careful, I guess, with what type of exercises you do do. There are some that aren't really recommended during the pregnancy, so definitely if you are ad advidly working out in a gym environment, have a chat to you, the trainers there and see what's safe and what's not, I guess. But also then rely on, you know, your healthcare and your pregnancy team and that team can also include a physio um, or an exercise physiologist as well. And those yeah. are other great resources as well in addition to your doctor and pharmacist uh, to get more information about this. Um, so I guess, yeah, wrapping up, um, definitely if, you know, you are experiencing, uh, I guess, unexplained weight gain, 
increased body hair, you know, you are of childbearing age and you are even on the younger side of that. Uh, you, you know, you might be slightly overweight as well. Uh, acne, one thing we yeah. didn't really touch about today is acne, but you know, we can definitely, we'll definitely explore that on another day. Uh, acne is a big one as well. Um, those are probably the main sort of signs and symptoms to start to look out for. And like I mentioned from the start is that this is very common. This is, you know, it's, over... Yeah. Over one to three, you know, Australians is, is, are suffering from one in ten, sorry, one in ten or up to three in ten um, are suffering from this uh, condition. So definitely reach out, you know, this is something quite normal, it's something quite common. Um, and definitely reach out to your pharmacist, your doctor, any of your other allied health professionals because there's definitely really good help out there and there's some really really good treatment programs as well so um yeah well thank you so much for joining us on this episode here about uh, natasha's journey through polycystic ovarian syndrome and where she's at throughout her pregnancy as well if you do have any comments or questions please post them down below Otherwise, please be sure to like and subscribe to our channel and hit that little notification bell to get informed as to when we post up our next video. And we'd love for you to share this content as well because like we said from the start, this is all about normalizing those conversations which do occur very often in our community. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have an awesome day. Thanks everyone. Take care now. Bye. Bye.